Thanks for joining us here at Light of the World. We aren't live right now, but we do want to offer you our most recent live stream in its entirety. If you only want to find the message, then check out our sermon archive section right here, and you'll be able to catch all of the recent messages we've taught. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Feel free to submit prayer requests via the button below, find our upcoming live stream schedule in the menu to the right, and we look forward to connecting with you online or in person this Sunday. Here's the service. Good morning, Light of the World. Welcome to the Church in Exile, week number one. We were a little shocked and surprised yesterday afternoon when we found out that a judge in Tarrant County forbid people from showing up to church to worship. Um, but we're trying to uh, make do with that the best that we possibly can. We can't see you, but we hope that you can see us. Um, we've spent a lot of time this past week doing things that we can do to uh, make our online streaming as, uh, um, as close to being here in person and as, as, um, as good as we possibly can. We've also had some discussions about um, whether or not we should pre-record and just play uh, the services. A lot of the big churches, the mega churches, are doing that. They're they're pre-recording their services so that they can give you just a, a perfect service with a perfect message and perfect worship. Um, I decided not to do that. Um, if you're watching us right now, you're watching us live, um, provided it is at uh, 10:30 on Sunday morning, and you're not watching a replay of it. But for me, it was important that as you're worshiping in your homes, that we would be worshiping right here with you, alongside with you. So. If the message is a little less than perfect, if the worship um, singing, which naturally online isn't going to sound nearly as good as what it is in person, as we're still working through some of that technology, uh, those technology issues, um, if things aren't perfect and ideal, it's because you know what? Uh, we're living in a not perfect and a not ideal world, and we're worshiping right alongside with you this morning. Um, we're so glad that you're here and so glad that you're worshiping with us. Would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Merciful Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this technology that you've given us that we're able to bring worship into the homes of, of your people. And I just pray, gracious God, that wherever we're at and whatever we're doing, that you'd help us to worship as you desire to be worshiped, that we would be fully engaged in you, whether it's through our phone or our computer screen or however it is we're watching this, and that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with us over this next hour and our, our time together. And though uh, great distances separate us, though we're broken up into individual families uh, watching this, we just pray, uh, merciful God, that our worship of you would be pleasing. We thank you uh, for your love. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for this opportunity to come together, if not virtually, uh, to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joe, would you lead us in worship this morning? Absolutely. All right, I know how you guys are. The football game begins, kickoff happens, and you all start cheering loudly for your team. That's fine, I'm not making fun of you. I'm saying we have an amazing God who's worthy of worship, so turn it up, kickoff is about to happen. Let's do this thing. Sing it out.
First of all, Almighty God, your word teaches us that wherever two or three are gathered, that you're with us. And this morning, like no other time throughout um, the history of the church, at least in this country, um, we're gathered in a bunch of two or threes, especially in those locations where um, we have been told that we can't gather together as a, a church and worship. And we just pray, gracious God, that wherever we are and however worship looks in our homes and the places that we come before you this morning, that you would receive our worship um, and that it would be pleasing uh, to you. Merciful God, we are living in, in a time of such high anxiety and worry and fear, and I just pray that you be with all those who um, are struggling with fear and, and just uncertainty about what tomorrow will bring, people that are worrying about their, their jobs, people that are worrying about uh, the sore throat that they have or the headache that they have or um, those that have uh, the virus already or those that have um, many other things that cause uncertainty, flu, strep, heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the many different things that we, we oftentimes have anxiety over, gracious God. We just trust in you. We trust in your, your word and your promise that not only where two or three are gathered, you are there, that you'll never leave us and that you'll never forsake us. Help us to live in that trust and in that confidence. Be with the leaders that are trying to make decisions that are best for our country. Let our leaders and let not the media feed into fear, but help us to make wise decisions based on facts and based on reality and not on, on panic and fear so that in all of this we can emerge on the other side without inflicting more damage upon ourselves because we're acting and responding out of fear. Merciful God, we all know people who are hurting this day, who are struggling, um, especially we want to lift up to you um, Evan and Mike as they continue um, 
having a battle cancer again. I just pray for strength and for healing for both of them. And for Steve, who is uh, struggling with uh, an illness of his own, we just pray that you be with Steve and that you give him complete healing as well. There's so many other people that we know that are dealing not only with illness, but hurt and heartache, anxiety and pain. Merciful God, we just humbly lay all of our concerns and all of our burdens before you this morning. We lay them before you in the name that is above every name, the name that every knee bows in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. It is in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we, we pray. Amen. Yes, have to forgive me, I'm not really used to talking to myself, let alone talking to myself for 30 minutes, uh, but I did do it once already in our early service, and I'm starting to like it. Maybe I'll talk to myself more often. Um, I've written this message three different times, so uh, um, I'll do my best to just give you one of those three messages, but I will tell you that originally we were going to try to do a service uh, every hour to rotate the people through here that want to worship and keep under uh, the limits um, of, uh, of what uh, we were allowed to have in here. And so I was committed, and I shared this uh, on Facebook, that I was committed to keep my message uh, relatively short. Um, since uh, that has been pulled away from us, I also pulled back my commitment to keep this message short, but I will keep it as short as I possibly can. Um, Earlier this week, I went to the uh, doctor's office, and uh, it was just a normal uh, yearly checkup, and it was a tale of two different worlds. When I walked into the doctor's office in the outer lobby, um, there was a, a great amount of fear and panic present. Um, every time someone walked through the door, and, and it, that was an interesting sight in and of itself, um, watching people walk through the door, they were opening doors with parts of bodies that I didn't know that you were able to open doors with. And every time someone came through the door, someone came out and, and Lysol, uh, uh, the handle and anything that they could have possibly have touched. Um, people were in masks of all different kinds of shapes and sizes, and, um, and, and people were sitting uh, opposite sides of each other, and there was a great amount of fear that was evident in, in that uh, room. But then it was interesting, when I was called uh, behind the door uh, by the nurse that normally sees me and, and to the back office to ultimately see the doctor, uh, she took me to the scale, she weighed me in, and I was interested to note she didn't have on gloves, she didn't have on a mask, she was standing as close as she normally would to me, talking to me the same way that she normally would. She took me back to the exam room. She took my um, temperature, my blood pressure, uh, did my EKG. Um, once again, the same precautions that uh, they would any time that I come in there. Uh, the doctor came in, and we both looked at each other like, well, we wanted to shake each other's hands, but um, almost like him not knowing how I would receive that and me not knowing how he would receive that, I just made a joke about the fact that I wouldn't shake his hand because I didn't want him to yell at me. And then, once again, he did not have a mask on. Uh, he was not wearing gloves. Uh, the exam went on like it normally did. And at the end, he said, I'll see you in six months. And I made a comment to uh, the fact that uh, hopefully things would be different then. And he's an older, good old country doctor. And he said, um, I suspect things will be, uh, will be blown over by then. And I said, yeah, with probably 20% unemployment. And he returned uh, by saying, uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a, uh, an exaggeration, isn't it, going on right now? And I said, I think so. I don't know if it is or if it isn't, 
But when I walked back outside that doctor's office and back to the lobby where the people were sitting, once again, um, uh, fear reigned and, and people were dressed differently than what they were on the other side of those doors from the medical professionals that were once again treating this virus like they do all viruses um, and always being responsible in, in how they uh, handle themselves. But it wasn't that way. Uh, fear reigned on the other side of that door. When I got home after a long days of work last night, I came across an article when I was looking at the news feed. It was from Bloomberg. And the article was COVID-19, the disease that divides us. And I was interested to read the article, and I did. And it spoke about how this disease is dividing us um, in this world and in, in this country. Um, one of the things that it pointed to is that the people who are uh, making racial jokes about where the disease came from, uh, calling it uh, like the China flu and just different things like that. But likewise, um, is, uh, as people in China have uh, rightfully so been a little sensitive to how some people have characterized it in this country and other parts of the world, uh, they're coming back and suggesting that this is potentially something that America had planted in their country. And, uh, and you, you see it's dividing us in terms of the world. It's also dividing us in this country in which we live. It's dividing us from people who, um, who are, have jobs and people who are losing jobs. It's dividing us from uh, people who will have insurance going forward and those who aren't going to have insurance going forward because they've lost their jobs. It's also dividing us uh, from people and between people who believe that um, uh, the fear and the panic that has gripped our land right now is good and it's appropriate and it's how we should be handling the situation and another group of people who say it's being completely overblown. Um, I just want everyone to understand that we can be controlled by fear and there's a lot of people who are making a lot of money off of fear and a lot of people who are trying to control us through fear. And so my encouragement to all of us who are listening to this message this morning is, don't listen to just what I'm saying. Certainly don't listen to what just the media is saying. L look for yourself. What are the facts and what is going on? And, and live by what is true and what we know to be real. Uh, to that end, I want to share with you some, some facts this morning so that as you hear the sermon that I'm giving uh, today, that you would understand it by today's uh, numbers. Uh, I, I came in this morning about 3.45 this morning to write this message for the third time. And when I came in this morning, I looked at the current uh, statistics on the virus so that um, as I give you this message, you would understand where my heart is and where I'm coming from. As of earlier this morning, um, the world has now uh, recorded three, 300,000 cases of the coronavirus. That is 300,000 cases in a world of 7.5 billion people. In the world, there's been 13,000 deaths as of this morning. That is, in a world of 7.5 billion people, there's been 13,000 deaths. In America, which is most relevant to most of us listening this morning, in America, as of this morning, there's been 30,000 confirmed cases um, with uh, about 250 deaths um, out of 350 million people in this country. Is it going to get worse? Absolutely, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. But we need to keep in mind that uh, I truly believe what the experts are saying, that this virus is worse than what we normally deal with with the flu virus. And we know from the flu virus that every year in America alone, 30 to 60 million people um, get the flu. And out of that 30 to 60 million people that get the flu, 30 to 60,000 people will die of the flu in America on any given year. So this virus is going to be worse than that. Um, there's going to, there, if it truly is worse, there ought to be 30 to 60 million or more people that get it. If it is more deadly than the flu, then we can fully expect that 30 to 60,000 people will die from it. But that's what happens every year, and we don't stop society because of that. Now, will it be way worse? We don't know. No one knows. But all we have is the facts as of today. So over three months into this virus uh, being on, uh, um, on this earth, or, or at least being uh, uh, transmitted on this earth, it's actually been on the earth for uh, much longer, 
but after uh, three and a half months or so, I want to share with you maybe a slightly different perspective than all those who are trying to um, promote fear in our country. And, and this is just the facts as of this morning. And the facts are this, that in Germany, right now, as of this morning, the death rate from this virus is 0.3%. That is a third of 1% in Germany. In South Korea, their death rate is 1%. In Switzerland, their death rate is 1%. And in America, as of this morning, the death rate is just slightly over 1%. These are the facts. This is also the facts. No one is disagreeing with the fact that there are a lot more people that have the virus than what we realize. Now, we know everyone who's died of the virus, but what we don't know is everyone who has it. So one thing is for certain is if a place like Germany has a death rate of 0.3%, the actual death rate will be less because there's people who have it that we don't know. In, in Switzerland, in America, in South Korea, if the death rate is 1%, it will actually be less because we don't know how many people have it. We just know that more people have it than we realize. Will the final death rate be a half a percent? Um, will it be three quarters of a percent? Will it be 0.25 percent? We just do not know. There's a lot of unknown. I just say this to encourage you with a different perspective, and I encourage you, don't listen to what I'm saying. Don't listen to what the media is saying. Uh, research the knowledge for yourself and make informed decisions. I need to say just a few things about the fact that um, as we're having church today, um, we're not allowed to have it in person. Uh, that came a little bit of a shock, actually came as a lot of a shock to me um, yesterday afternoon when I found out. And as I had to leave to just kind of clear my mind and, and, and process uh, what a judge in, in our government had done here uh, in Tarrant County, um, I drove by uh, targets and, and places like that and, and they were packed. Um, a lot of people were there. And up until this point of this uh, ruling as of yesterday, I believe that the balance that our government had towards the churches had been correct, that they grouped churches not quite in with the grocery stores, even though I, in many respects I believe we should, uh, because spiritual food is every bit as important as physical food, but they certainly grouped us into the same category as um, home improvement stores and different places like that, in which we were allowed to gather together as long as we practice social distancing, um, up to half of what your occupancy is, or 125, whichever was the lower number. That was good, and that was right. But the decision that was made yesterday afternoon, I do not believe, um, was a good decision that was made, because as of yesterday afternoon, um, there's many places that are allowed to remain open come tomorrow. Um, office buildings, convenience stores, manufacturing places, daycares, um, grocery stores and home stores, and many more. When I leave here today, I can go and get a big gulp, and, um, and there'll be other people in the store with me as I get that big gulp. When I leave later today, I can go to Home Depot and I can get fertilizer for my yard. I can get ant killer. Um, I can get lumber. Um, I can uh, uh, buy whatever I want from that store. But as of yesterday afternoon, they considered a church non-essential. They've grouped us into the same category as they grouped in a place in which you go get your hair cut, the place in which you get your nails done, and massage parlors. As a believer in God and God being uh, the almighty creator of this universe, that is um, so disappointing and honestly quite offensive to me that uh, the church um, would be grouped in with uh, businesses such as where we get our hair cut, um, where we get our nails done, and a place to get massages. I hope and I pray that our government officials will change their mind on that, that they would understand that at a time like this, if ever we needed the church, if ever we needed to come together and cry out and call out to the almighty God of the universe, it is now, and to at least give a person the right to do that, that we have the ability to practice social distancing every bit as much as people who go to Home Depot to get their lumber and to get their fire ant killer. Um, you know, Jesus spoke about times such as this, and I want to share that with you this morning. And Jesus said from Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 to 28, he said this, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. 
Instead, fear the one who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. We are living in a day and age in which there is utter panic and fear from that which can kill the body. But this virus, whatever it is, if it turns out to be 1%, a half of a percent, or a quarter of a percent that will kill the body, we know that there's a virus called sin that will kill 100% of people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And that is what we need to be alarmed about. We should be uh, in a panic about that. Always at times of crisis, the church has been the place where people went to in order to find comfort in times of chaos. I remember after September 11th, the, the, the church just exploded because people had such fear. They realized that they weren't in control of, of life, and they sought out the church in order to find comfort and peace. Right now, I'm living a day and age in which we're telling the community as a society, go seek out the church through your phone and through a computer screen. The church is closed. My friends in Christ Jesus, I'm not comfortable with that. And for those of you who are part of this congregation, for those of you who are part of the body of Christ throughout this world, now more than ever, I'm asking you, we need you to be the church in your community and in your workplace. We need you to, uh, to represent what the church is and what the church is about, to be there for those people who are hurting, that are looking to, uh, for that good news of comfort that only the church has. We need you more than ever to be the church in your place. America cannot afford to have its church grouped in with massage parlors, nail salons, and places where we get our hair cut. I encourage you to speak out, speak to county officials, city officials, your senators, whoever, and allow the church to be able to exercise the same judgment that people are able to that are going to get their fertilizer today, weed killer, and lumber. Because our doors are closed, we as a church are somewhat limited in what we can do right now, but I want to share with all of you listening what I'm committed to do as a pastor of Light of the World and what our church is committed to do right now. First and foremost, whenever legally we are allowed to open our doors again to have worship and to do ministry, I am committed to doing that. I don't care if I have to do eight services a weekend in order to meet whatever criteria that, that, that the city puts on us. We will have worship when we're allowed to have worship again. Secondly, I'm going to come to you with a real practical um, situation. Because of the hoarding that's gone on in our country, um, there's a shortage of many things, including toilet paper. Um, right now, we have a uh, janitorial closet that's filled with toilet paper, and we have a building that has been shut down by the county. Uh, for those of you who are listening today, if you are low or, or in fear that you're going to run out of toilet paper, message me as soon as this service is over. I will meet you at any time that I can. And I'm committed to giving out uh, two rolls of toilet paper per family until we do not have any more toilet paper in stock. I've requested that we have more delivered, hopefully tomorrow on Monday. If those deliveries can happen, if those businesses aren't shut down, uh, hopefully we will refill our um, our. Uh, closets with uh, toilet paper, and we'll be able to continue that offer. But as long as we have it, I'm committed to doing it. I'm asking all of you that are listening today, continue to support us at Light of the World, because um, estimates are 20% of, of our population are going to be losing their jobs. There's a lot of people who've already lost their jobs, and I'm committed as the pastor of this church to do everything that I can to try to help our uh, family here at Light of the World that have lost their job, help them out um, as much as we possibly can. The only way that we're able to do that is if we continue to trust in God, and we continue to give God our first fruits of, of all that we have. And I'm here to promise you that as long as we do that, um, our church is going to be here for one another, and we're going to support one another, and we're going to help one another through these difficult times. And lastly, I was in a conversation with a member yesterday who's connected with a uh, organization that re receives shipments of food. I was asked that as a church, if we would be willing to receive um, a pallet of food this coming week or multiple pallets to distribute to the community, I said I would be thrilled to do so. 
If that happens, I'm going to be asking for all of our friends and members of Light of the World to come up to the church and to uh, receive the food that we, re that, that we receive. And even if you don't need that food in your house, what I'm asking you to do is to, to go to your neighbors and to go to people who are in need and to hand out that food. And as you hand out that food, share the love of Christ that, that, that you are part of Light of the World and you're part of this organization that is helping to distribute food to people who are in need as we continue to be Christ to the community community around us. As we uh, gather together to worship, um, my intention was to start a new sermon series this morning, and that sermon series is going to continue between now and Easter. And uh, that sermon series is called, as you saw in our bumper this morning, Comfort in Times of Chaos because I understand that we are living in times of chaos. And in times of chaos, there's several things that lead to the chaos. And what I want to focus on for the remainder of our time this morning is that what causes chaos in our lives uh, primarily is when we feel out of control. When you've ever lost a job, you feel out of control, and chaos can just spiral into your life. If you've ever lost a relationship and you didn't realize that that was coming, when that happened, you experienced chaos in your life. If you've ever experienced divorce, and especially if you didn't expect that to happen, when that loss came into your life, you experienced chaos. When you found out that you, uh, from the doctor, had a loss of your health in your life, once again, chaos comes. Whenever we lose something and we didn't see it coming, that brings chaos into our lives. Right now, I understand, my friends in Christ Jesus, so many of us are experiencing chaos in our lives. I've seen it here at the church. We've had to let all of our uh, preschool teachers go because school is not in session. They've received their last paycheck. I've already cut back on several ministry positions. Um, I, I've spoken to my brother who manages a hotel and a restaurant in Tennessee, and he shared with me the grief that he has as he's letting his employees go. Um, he shared with me uh, just a couple days ago that his wife has been placed on, um, uh, been laid off for the next three weeks without pay in the chaos that is putting his, uh, his life in. I've spoken to so many people who've literally said in the last couple days, Pastor, I don't know come Monday if I have a job. We have seen our bank accounts or our investments at least uh, go down uh, by half or more. We've seen our college funds for our, our children, our retirement, all of that just disappear. My friends in Christ Jesus, I understand we are in times of chaos right now, and my heart breaks for all of you, all of us who are in this situation right now. What lesson can be learned of this? Well, let me be clear, I don't know how this came about. There's a lot of theories of, uh, of how this has taken place. There's a lot of beliefs in, in, in how this is going to unfold. I don't know how it truly came about. I don't know what the, 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 the final picture of this is going to look like. But I do know this, that we have a God who insists that we understand that we are not in control, but he is in control. We have a God who has shown us at multiple times throughout history that, in fact, he is in control. And I want to share with you one of those passages from Scripture this morning from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. It actually takes place after the time of the flood. The Scriptures don't tell us how often or, or when it exactly happened. It may have been, some speculate, 100 years after the flood. Others say it may have been about 700 years after the time of the flood. Whether it was 100 years, 300 years, 700 years, we don't know. But after the time of the flood, the people were feeling kind of good about themselves. Everyone spoke the, the same language. Everyone was working together. And, and they really kind of started to believe that they were in control of their own destiny. And God um, wanted them to understand that wasn't the case. Let's take a look at our scripture this morning. Now, the whole world had one language, and they had a common speech. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. And they said, they said to one another, come, let's make bricks, and let's bake them thoroughly instead of, uh, instead of the way that they had been doing it before with stone and tar and mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, 
so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the entire earth. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Let us confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and as a result, they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused their language, the language of the entire world, and from there the Lord scattered them all over the face of the earth. As I read the story, what I would call this is a holy cuff. And some of you are like, what did you just say? What is a holy cuff? Well, let me explain. Growing up in my family, um, when people spoke nonsense, when people had a uh, skewed understanding of reality, what we would do is we would walk up beside them and we would cup our hands like this and we would just kind of crack them in the back of the head. And when you did that, it would kind of make this, uh, this cup sound, this cuffing sound, and, and we would call that cuffing someone. And you did that to knock some sense in them. This is what God is doing in this situation. In fact, there's been three times up until this point in the 2,000-year history of the earth that God has instituted a holy cuff on his creation, mankind, to help them to understand that they are not the ones in control. The first was after Adam and Eve fell into sin. After Adam and Eve fell into sin, they kind of felt like they were uh, in control of, of their own destiny and everything that uh, was going on. God comes and he kind of slaps them upside uh, their collective heads and says, that's not the case. Um, and he uh, gives uh, a curse, a curse not only to them, but a curse to the earth and to uh, uh, the animals. And, and honestly, the entire universe goes under this curse as God says, you know what? You are not the ones in control. I am. The second time that God does, is, does that is at the time of the flood. At the time of the flood, humanity kind of forgot about God, and they were kind of thinking that they were in control of their destiny. Scripture tells us they were eating and drinking. They were giving no concept or any worry about what tomorrow would bring and who God was. And then God comes and gives this holy cuff upside the t side of their heads, and he comes and he floods the earth, and he helps mankind to see and to understand that, you know what, you might think you're in control, but you're not. And so now the third time in the first 2,000 years of the history of mankind, we see the story of the Tower of Babel in which this holy cuff comes where God smacks humanity upside uh, its head. He confuses their language and he stops their ability uh, from uh, building uh, the city. Now, some of you sit there and you read this and say, Pastor, you can't believe that that story is really true. That's just a fable in which um, God is, or, or, or mankind is trying to understand where we get different races, where we get different languages. Don't fool yourself. It's a true story. It is actually quite easy for God to confuse mankind. In fact, when we look throughout the Old Testament, there's several stories, several di different times where uh, Israel is going into battle. And they're facing an army of, uh, of tens of thousands of people. And God says, I just want you to come with a, with a few hundred people. In fact, I want you to watch from a distance. Watch what I, the Lord your God, am going to do. And God somehow, some way, causes that for, foreign army to become confused, to stop working together, to turn on each other, and literally to, to kill and defeat one another as Israel sits back and watches. It is not hard for God to interject confusion into society. You don't think that God has done that in the past? Scripture is clear, and God can very easily do that today. You don't believe so? I want to encourage you. Uh, Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And as pastors of churches, we, we kind of skip a line in there. We don't like to speak too much about it, but it's a real significant line that we need to pay attention to in this day and age. And that line is this. Jesus taught this, mind you. He said, and pray this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why in the world would Jesus teach his followers and us that as we pray to God to pray, lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. This isn't a message you're going to hear in most churches, but I'm sorry, it's the Word of God, and we have to be real with it. Jesus says this because throughout history, God has at times led His people into temptation. And, and, and folks, if there's ever been a time, you and I need to be on our collective knees right now praying to God, please, dear God, we are sorry for believing that we are in control of our lives, but God, please, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into confusion. Cause us to not be confused and to turn against ourselves and cause us to, to stop building the city and taking care of the city and, and, and allowing civilization to fall apart because we've become confused because ultimately we think that we're in control than you. I'm calling on Christians everywhere. Get on your knees and pray that, that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. I promised that in this message series that I was going to give us um, ways to find comfort in times of chaos. This morning we're looking at the chaos of feeling out of control, and I want to share with you three things that we can do to feel um, comfort in, in our lives right now as we feel out of control. Uh, the first is this, and I'm going to ask that every one of you that's listening at your home right now that you speak these words out loud in your homes. Speak this right now. I am not in control. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If I'm sitting in my home right now, I'd probably feel like a moron doing that, and I didn't do it. So if that's you, please say it in your head, because we all need to say this. I am not in control. That is step number one. And if we find comfort in, in the chaos of being out of control, we need to surrender to the fact that we're not in control. I have to tell you, I, I, I've understood that for my life. In fact, I, I do worse in the smaller decisions because in the smaller decisions, I'm always second-guessing myself. As I'm talking to my kids, and I, I can always go back and think, you know what, I, I should have handled that situation better. When I'm making decisions for the church, um, I, in retrospect, I, I can make decisions better all the time. I have to tell you that when I am in the stock market, if there is a way to make the wrong decision and to sell stock and to watch the market zoom up 20 minutes later, I always make the wrong decision. I realize that my decisions are not perfect. But you know what? There's something liberating in knowing that I'm not in control. Right now, I don't like the fact that, that people feel like a virus is blowing through the air like pollen, and that they think that they can't even leave their homes. Um, that's frustrating to me, but I understand that I'm not in control. It's frustrating to me that um, everyone in Tarrant County can go to Home Depot at any point today, tomorrow, or whenever, and, and, and get the stuff that they want from it, um, but uh, you were not able to come to church today if you wanted. But I understand that I'm not in control. All of us in here need to understand that we are not in control, and when we understand that, when we hand that off to the Lord, that is liberating. The second thing that we need to understand is this, and I'm asking you guys once again to say this in your home if you're truly brave, and if you're not brave, say it in your head, and that is this, even though I know that I am not in control, I can make a difference. Say that right now in your head or out loud, I can make a difference. You see, we're not in control, but because we're not in control, that doesn't mean we don't care, and that doesn't mean that we don't try, because in every situation, we can make a difference even though we're not in control. Two or three years ago, I was painting the outside of my house because I believe that where I can save money, I ought to, and so I'm not going to pay someone to paint the outside of my house when I can do it myself. I borrowed a really tall ladder, and I bought a sprayer, and, uh, and I decided to paint my entire house. Now, when I was, it's a two-story house up around the roof line, I was probably about 25 feet in the air. I'm not particularly fond of heights, and I thought to myself, all right, Greg, um, you're not in control of this, but you need to make a difference and to do what you can um, if you start to fall. And in fact, at one point, being 25 feet up in the air, literally, uh, the, the ladder moved about five feet. But because I taught myself, you know, that I can make a difference and not panic, I actually didn't panic. And for me, uh, who is a very jumpy person, that was quite the accomplishment. Thankfully, I didn't fall to the ground. 
Now, many years ago, uh, probably about 13, 14 years ago, I was painting in the cafe here at Light of the World. Uh, my feet were probably about 8 to 10 feet in the air, so my head was more like uh, 14 to 16 feet in the air. And I'd been painting all day, and I really felt my legs really start becoming weak. And it became clear that I was about to fall. And very quickly as that was happening, I decided that, you know what, even though I'm not in control, I can make a difference. And so I made a, a split second decision that I was going to jump rather than fall out of control. It was a good decision. I landed on my feet because I knew I could make a difference. But in the end, I wasn't ultimately in control and I actually landed on the ladder. I rolled my ankle and I broke it. But you know what? I did make a difference because I didn't land on my back. I didn't break my neck. I didn't crack my head. I couldn't control that. That's where the ladder landed. But I did keep myself from being hurt uh, more significantly and more seriously. My friends in Christ Jesus, whenever you're in chaos, I want to encourage you. You can make a difference, and there's things that you can do. If you have lost a loved one, there's things that you can do. You can go to grief share, and you can begin to heal and to recover from that. When we lose our jobs, we can go out and try to find another job. We can talk to our neighbors. Um, we can talk to our church and, and see what kind of help that we can get as we come together as the body of Christ to help one another. If you've gone through a divorce or recently are going through a divorce, you need to be able to see a counselor and go see a counselor. Do what you can and begin to heal. Certainly right now in this time of chaos, I want to encourage every one of you, we need to be doing the smart things to make a difference. I'm encouraging you, make good decisions with your money. This isn't a good time to be wasting your money. But this is also not a good time to, to become stingy. Uh, continue to, to use your money smartly as God's given it to you to be a blessing not only to you, but to those who are in need around you. Make smart decisions with the food that you get. Um, I normally don't go out to eat because we buy our groceries and try to save money. But over the last couple of weeks, the situation's changed. And honestly, I didn't feel like going to the store and, and not being able to find meat. If there was meat, I didn't want to have a wrestling match over a package of chicken breast or ground beef. So two different times this week, I thought, you know what? For just a little bit more money and in order to support other people, we can go through the drive through in order to get our meat rather than fight people over meat in the grocery store. So on one day, we, uh, we kicked the bucket. We went to KFC and we got a 16-piece bucket of chicken and it was uh, enough meat for a couple days. On another day, it was Tuesday tacos at Rosa's. And honestly, on Tuesday tacos, you can eat for uh, just a little bit more than what you can cook yourself. So rather than fight other people for meat, listen, we can be smart about this and we can support other businesses and really not be out any more money. You can make a difference. I'm asking all of you right now, do not hoard food. Do not hoard toilet paper. I just went to the grocery store this past Friday, and there are so many shelves empty. You can make a difference. Please, in this time of chaos, um, do not live out of fear and panic, and do not hoard stuff. And help your neighbor. Um, I was speaking to um, uh, an elderly uh, member of this congregation, and you know what he told me? I think it was just yesterday. He said, you know what, I was so touched by my neighbor because my neighbor um, doesn't go to church and as far as I know, they don't even believe in God. But they came over to the house and they asked how we were doing. They said, you know what, you're high risk and you do not need to be leaving your house. What can we get for you? That neighbor who's not even a believer took a list from uh, this, this elderly couple and they went out and bought just about everything that was on their list. They came back a couple hours later and they said, here you go, um, we're sorry, but we weren't able to get flour. The couple said, no, thank you so much. We appreciate that you're willing to do this. But you know what that couple did? They went back out again and they searched for a couple hours until they found flour for that elderly couple and they returned yet again because they knew that that's how you treat a neighbor. My friends in Christ Jesus, if you're listening to this, if you're a believer in, in Christ Jesus, let us please um, act at least, if not a hundred times more, than what people who are not believers. You can't control life, but you can make a difference. Please do. And the last point that I want to encourage you with that I'm asking you to say out loud this morning is this. Though I'm not in control, and though I know I can make a difference, 
Say this out loud or say it in your head. God is in control. Because we need to understand that, in fact, God is in control. Look at Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 30. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about what you will eat or about your body or what you will wear. For life is more than food. The body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add even a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflower grows. They do not labor and they do not spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, with all of his wealth and Solomon and all of his splendor, was even dressed like one of these. If that is how God will clothe the grass of the field which is here today, and tomorrow will be thrown into the fire, how much more will God clothe you, you of little faith? Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink or even worry about it. For the pagans and the unbelievers, they run after such as these things. But your Father, your Father knows that you need them. God is in control. The funny thing about God being in control is it doesn't always seem like he is. When you read the book of Revelation, it seems like God isn't in control. But even as all these plagues are coming, as even as all these trials and difficulties are coming, when you read the final page of Revelation, guess what? The entire time, God was in control. When you read the book of Job, Job underwent all kinds of trials and difficulties and persecutions. His body was inflicted with sores and plagues. His, his family, uh, his kids were all killed. Um, his property was stolen. Uh, he, everything was taken from him. Everything was lost. It seems as if God wasn't in control, but when you read the final story of Job, God restores multiple times to Job, multiple times everything that he had before. In fact, God was in control. When we look at the, the, the story of Jesus coming into this world, it appears that, that God isn't in control. It appears that Jesus is weak. He's arrested. He is mocked. He is spat upon. He is whipped. A crown of thorns is put in his head. He dies. But when you read the whole story, it's clear that God was in control the whole time. Jesus' disciples were on a boat with him. A great storm arose. They were within moments of literally losing their life. They cried out in fear to God. It seemed like God wasn't in control, but Jesus arose. He rebuked the disciples because their lack of faith. Why? Because the entire time God was, in fact, in control. God spoke to the wind and the waves, and it calmed. In all things in life, whatever you're going through right now, right now, in the midst of the fear and the panic of the coronavirus, I can assure you, God is in control. Scripture promises us that God will work all things to the good of those who love him. I don't know how this will turn out. I don't know if it's going to be the worst case predictions. I don't know if it's going to be what it appears to be at this point. I don't know. God's the one that's in control, and he will see us through all of it. We need to trust him and to have faith in him. I want to leave you with a couple final thoughts, and that is this. I encourage all of you who are listening this morning in faith, please, please live in confidence rather than fear. I'm asking you to live out your faith boldly to those around you. You are the church right now while these doors are closed, while the church is in exile, while we're told that we can no longer gather as a group of people. You in your homes and in your neighborhoods and in your work, you are the church. Live in a confidence, not in fear. Be the light of God to the world around you. Stop coveting life. 
Jesus said, for those who are trying to save their lives, they will lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. I'm asking for all of you to prayerfully consider this. If you and I right now at the conclusion of this message are able to go to 7-Eleven with a store full of people and get a big gulp, get a hot dog. If we're able to go to Home Depot, Lowe's, any home store right now, if people are allowed to go to their daycares tomorrow and their places of employment, I believe that we in the church should be at least included with people who are going to places like that and not with haircuts, nail salons, and massage parlors. If our government's going to trust people to act responsibly in Home Depot and in daycares and in places of business, the government can trust us as Christians to gather responsibly and to practice um, social distancing so that we can come together and call out to our almighty God who needs to hear from our lips right now. We know that you are in control. We are sorry that we thought we were. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Merciful almighty God, have mercy on us as a society that at times throughout history, the church has gathered under certain fear of death and knowledge of death, starting from the time of Rome and being thrown in the lion's den to places like Iran and Pakistan and India and so forth, where as people gather, they gather knowing that there's a good chance that if found, they will die. Help us, gracious God, not to fear death. Help us, gracious God, to not put our hope in things of this world. Help us, gracious God, to understand that we are not in control. Have mercy on us, merciful God. We surrender all to you. We know that ultimately you are in control. And we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of final thoughts. I don't know when uh, this will change. Um, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Ultimately, God is in control. But I am committed that when I, I, in light of the world, can continue to gather people again in faith, um, we will do that. Um, until then, we will explore options of, of ways in which we can do our ministry remotely and bring it into your homes, whether that be Bible studies or um, devotionals or different things. Um, we will uh, certainly be working on that on this end. If you need toilet paper, if you need help, if you need assistance, um, we will uh, do what we can uh, to meet your needs uh, where you're at. Um, since you weren't able to come to church today, your children were not able to receive children's ministry. We want to thank all of our friends at Life Church who um, uh, have painstakingly put together a children's program that could be shown at the end of online worship so that your children would have the opportunity to now worship the way that they would uh, learn and understand uh, the message of God. So uh, we thank the people at Life Church for putting this together. And as at the conclusion of these remarks, if you have children at home, I, can, I encourage you to uh, continue the live stream as uh, you will uh, have live streamed into your home a worship specifically for your children. Uh, may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard and keep all of you both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream today. Before you go, make sure that you check in with us. If you're on our website, just click connection card in the top right. If you're on Facebook, head over to lotwchurch.org slash check in. For more information, you can always see our website, as well as find contact information for all of us here on staff. Thank you so much for being part of our community, for being part of the mission of Light of the World, which is to bring the light of God into our lives and others so that all may believe. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and God bless. We look forward to seeing you next week.